What's happening, folks? Geologist Philip Prince talking about Appalachian earthquakes. Had a good one this morning. Magnitude 4.1. Happened about 15 miles underneath the ground surface, underneath that big yellow dot right there in East Tennessee. First and foremost, where the heck is this? Uh, not a lot of, of big geographic references that are easy to see in this view. Got Gatlinburg, Tennessee. We'll make that a different color up there in the top right. So we got Gatlinburg right up there. Uh, sort of the high, kind of the high ridge, the crest of the Great Smoky Mountains running like that. Fontana Lake down here and uh, Fontana Dam is an interesting landmark to have close to a, an earthquake event. Got Cades Cove right there. Knoxville, Tennessee is up off the uh, up off the north edge of the screen, and Asheville would be kind of off the off the right side of the uh, the screen there. What's up with an earthquake like this happening in the Appalachians? That's not really something we tend to associate with this part of the world. As it turns out, in eastern Tennessee, tons of earthquakes all the time. They just tend to be quite small. At 4.1, this one was, was much more noticeable than a lot of them. And its overall movement, in terms of what actually shifted down there deep to cause the earthquake, actually fits really nicely with what tends to happen in this part of the world. So uh, so how do you, how do you know that? Uh, the earthquake happened one hour and 40 minutes ago at 9.04 a.m. Uh, the USGS already has tons of information publicly available on a website that tells you some of the particular details about this quake that are actually pretty useful to, to understanding what went on here. Um, does this earthquake have to do with these mountains? There's a lot of big mountains here. If you look at a geologic map of this area, it's covered in fault lines. I'm going to do that momentarily. What's uh, what's up? Are there connections? You can use this USGS information uh, to answer a lot of those questions pretty quickly. Actually, quite amazing that within that that short amount of time, you can already see what you uh, what you need to see here. So if you Google USGS earthquakes, that's all you need to do. It'll take you to a hazard site there. And you will see reference to this earthquake 21 kilometers southeast of Greenback, Tennessee. They just have to have some geographic reference to give you a sense of where it happened. Has latitude and longitude, but from the geologic side, there's an important part. 20, 25 kilometers deep. It's a little over 15 miles underneath the ground surface. That's quite important to thinking about what was going on here, which you'll see when we diagram this out. And for the geologists, the all-important what we call beach ball right there. You can probably see why. Crazy looking diagram. That's it. Beach ball is not just a clever name. It really looks like a beach ball. Uh, what does that tell you? Uh, among other things, it tells you what type of, of movement occurred to release the energy that was felt as the earthquake. And in this particular case, it's telling you that movement was like that likely along a fault. Let me get that other color in there that runs like that through the landscapes. So basically like an east-west fault uh, and it had this it had this strike slip kind of motion as we call it along it. Uh, what's important about that? Well you're you're not seeing slip on a fault that's that's pushing rock up, right? You got this big mountainous area where you think, well there's there's rising rock here. That was not the type of movement that occurred with this quake. Uh, and in fact, what you see there with that diagram suggesting that it, it strikes slip motion like you'd, see, like you'd see in Southern California. A lot of the San Andreas system has this type of movement associated with it. It's just the top going to the right on the San Andreas as opposed to the top going to the left here. One way or another, fully expected. This is, is very typical to see with what we call the East Tennessee Seismic Zone which is this area of nearly constant earthquake activity in East Tennessee that just tends to be so small, nobody really thinks much much about it. Um, can you connect movement like that in any way to what's going on on the land surface? Like, is that why there's big smoky mountains here? Is like, is the earthquake, is, is that just sort of another chapter in these mountains growing? That's actually something that people that people argue over quite a bit, but really what you what you see on the land surface today is almost entirely a product of bedrock type, or at least the way the mountains are set up can't be disconnected from what kind of rock is present on the Earth's surface. That's something that that necessitates drawing, which uh, as you know with any video on this channel 
is always right around the corner. But before we do that, it's worth looking at, at a geologic map of East Tennessee relative to the mountains just to see what, what's present out there where this quake happened. So we'll draw a... Uh, We'll draw ourselves a dot there where the where the quake happened 15 miles deep. So that's the uh, that's the epicenter there that I've drawn in, uh, which again means the the point directly above where the actual slip in the rock occurred. Pretty close to those real big Great Smoky Mountains that you see there. Um, that is in many ways just a coincidence, uh, as we are about to see. But before we do the drawing. Um, You need to you need to see what the geologic map looks like here. It has these sort of parallel parallel bands of color there that that sort of run along the trend of the mountains, absolutely covered in these little black lines. And if you click on them, fault, fault, fault. Whoa, there's a lot of faults here. Um, in fact, I mean, there's hundreds, thousands. If you were to look, if you were to look small enough, those faults tend to be nicely parallel. To those to those bands of color so they run kind of along the the trend of the mountains there and these are actually faults that are associated with crunching the edge of the continent there uh, to build up the Appalachian Mountains way in the deep geologic past uh, these actually are not the faults that have anything to do with the with this earthquake event that happened this morning so what is uh what is actually underneath this part of East Tennessee and Western North Carolina that makes it look like this. Uh, earthquake happened right right along the, the edge of the mountains there. So, you know, it looks like it's associated with some kind of a boundary, but is that really a boundary that, that has something to do with this particular event or is it just kind of a kind of a relic, if you will, of the, uh, the assembly of the Appalachians? So let's, let's get it rolling here. Uh, try to try to fire this one up efficiently here. Going to have to make a little bit deeper and, and sort of thicker of a diagram than I typically make. May have to move my lovely picture there in the bottom right of the screen as well. I think we can make it very nice. So we'll start with, uh, start with the land surface on this diagram. And what we're trying to put together here is that you have this area of of pretty rugged mountains here that's going to be the Smokies and kind of the foothills of the Smokies that are running down there into East Tennessee. Uh, the biggest the biggest topographic relief in the Appalachian Mountains uh, over a given distance of miles is actually from Gatlinburg to the top of Mount LeConte. So these are legitimately, they're legitimately big mountains. That elevation difference between Gatlinburg and LeConte uh, is right about one mile. It's about 1.6 kilometers. Uh, I actually don't know what the overland distance is, but it's a, uh, it's it's substantial, and that's actually by a decent margin in the Southern Appalachians. That's that's the biggest thing that you're going to find. So that's what we're what we're trying to draw here is these big kind of gorges and stream valleys that are going up to this highest Smokies Ridge there, and there really is a very very abrupt boundary between those mountains and the flatter Tennessee Valley and then the ridges that you get out in out in the Appalachian Valley and Ridge. I've exaggerated it here just so it's really easy to see, but yes, suffice it to say, the Smokies are way, way, way bigger than any of the Valley and Ridge ridges in this part of the Appalachians, right? So got the landscape down there and that that big boundary that we're so interested in runs kind of like that because our earthquake would have happened way down deep you know under a location that would be something would be something like something like that right there okay so what's what's under the ground here well these big rugged mountains are developed on rocks that are sitting on top of a big fault that's that black line that i just drew right there but that's not the fault that produced the uh, that produced the earthquake event here. That's a fault that's related to the assembly of the Appalachians again, way on back in geologic time. And what's further down under that? Something like you see here, just kind of a shingled, repeated sequence 
of sedimentary rocks. And we have another layer down underneath that. We're going to try to color all this in here so we can fully appreciate the contrast. Did I close all the lines? Ooh, one more. It's not bad for Saturday morning. I like it. What's deeper? Oh, no. Can't win them all. We have to close the line up there. So that last that last critical part there, the gray color, was going to define what's actually underneath all of those stacked colorful layers that are producing the, the mountain landscape that you see today. And that gray rock is what we call basement. That is the deep continental crust. Everything above that was, was pushed into place during Appalachian assembly. What are some, some thicknesses right here? What kind of distances are we looking at? Um, from the land surface to the top of that gray rock in this part of the world, through all of those shingled rock sequences, I don't know, six, six miles, maybe five miles, something like that. Um, not, not 20, not, not 15 kilometers or not 15 miles, not, not 25 kilometers. It's hard to go back and forth as a geologist. I don't know. I have to work in kilometers most of the time, but, uh, we still don't really speak that here in the U S so underneath where the, uh, the earthquake actually happened, the event itself would have been, it would have been down like that. It is way, way, way far, almost, almost twice as deep as the very bottom of, of all of this structured rock, the top of which is making all of these really awesome mountain landscapes that, that we deal with today. Uh, we don't even know that much about what's, what's going on fault wise down here, down here really deep, but there are breaks, weaknesses in that gray, what we call basement again, kind of the, the, the continental crust on top of which all this stuff is pushed into place. If you get the stress right. And in this particular case, most folks would tell you that the mountains are being squeezed kind of like I've drawn here. They're kind of being squeezed like roughly parallel to the trend of the Appalachians. There's there's squeezing from, from the northeast and from the southwest. So you could imagine like one hand in the panhandle of Florida and one hand in New York or something and you're you're kind of like squeezing almost parallel to the to the edge of North America. You put that kind of stress on the right fault lines way down deep here and they're going to move a little bit. The fault lines here that have stacked all these different rock types on top of each other, they aren't oriented very well to move again with, with the way the, uh, the mountains are being squeezed today. So all of those, all those threatening looking faults, when you look at that geologic map and it's like, oh, there's a fault running right there. There's a fault running right there. There's another one, another one, another one. Those are all just sort of holdovers from the, uh, from the assembly of the Appalachians. And in fact, particularly back here, in the rocks that are supporting those really rugged smoky mountains those are absolutely full of faults too so there's there's no shortage of them but they're totally totally different from what we had happen this morning what had happened this morning way down deep in the basement if you read about the the east tennessee seismic zone you know 20 20 ish kilometers so looking at 12 13 15 miles something like that that's a pretty typical that's a pretty typical depth for for seismicity in this part of the world so when you see those fault lines on that map, when you see the big mountains, it's a different concept. The only possibility is, and this is also argued about quite a bit, maybe if you have a lot of movement way down here deep over time, if the right type of movement was occurring, you might be able to, to gently kind of lift or warp the mountains above that and sort of keep them high and rugged over a longer period. Again, argued about quite a lot. There's also evidence that there have been bigger earthquakes in this part of the world in the past. Uh, folks are interested in that because of dams like Fontana, nuclear power plants, big cities. There's a lot going on in the in the Tennessee Valley. And there's evidence that that there have been bigger events in the past, but it seems like they were many, many tens or hundreds of thousands of years ago or, or even longer. There's also argument over when they happen. But it's a, it's a different type of movement from the movement that was actually stacking rocks to build the mountains 
uh, that were then eroded into into what you see today. Kind of a cool way to uh, to look at the Appalachians, and it's really interesting to think that, particularly like in in this area right here, all of those big rugged mountains at the surface, the the roots of those in terms of the rock that is supporting them, it's actually it's actually quite shallow. So those big mountains are. We'll have to clear all those lines out of here. Nope, don't do that either. All right, get back to Google Earth. The big mountains that you see right here are are I don't know, they're they're like a big slab of rock almost that's been pushed into place. And if you were to start drilling in that location, you would very, very quickly get down through that rock type that makes those big mountains and actually get into the rocks that you see out closer to Knoxville or something like that. So it's a really it's a really cool setup. Uh, it would be interesting if if some of these faults are still moving, but nope, it's it's all way all way down deep underneath of that. Um, so why why is there why is there enough stress here to make these earthquakes happen? Well, one answer to that possibly is that, like I said, eastern North America is being it's being squeezed kind of like that. Uh, there has been a huge amount of rock eroded away. from this part of the Appalachians. So that's been kind of taking weight off the mountains. That might allow things to shift around. If you go not too far back in geologic time, well, you had uh, you had ice sheets. Oops. Get an ice sheet drawn in here. So you had a big bunch of glaciers come down and put a huge amount of weight on the Earth's crust. It seems like that's really far away. Geologically, it's not that far away. Maybe that caused some kind of irregularity or in, in the stress and the crust down here in the Southern Appalachians. We did not have glaciers anywhere close to these mountains, but big ice sheets that are a mile or more thick, it's a huge amount of weight on the surface of the earth. So that can cause disturbances as well. So there's plenty of, uh, there's plenty of possible answers there. Um, there's so many earthquakes in the East Tennessee seismic zone. If you look at where they are as little dots, little dots on the map. I mean, there's, there's a pretty good understanding that this is just, again, a weak spot in the earth's crust that is responding to that stress. Should you expect a big one here? No one, no one knows. Again, there's evidence that that might've happened in the past, but if, if that's something that's upcoming, there's not, There's not immediate evidence, I guess, for that, uh, at least in terms of, of published information. But if you know it happened in the reasonably recent geologic past, and again, that's geologically speaking, it's something that you uh, it's something that you got to keep in mind. So occasionally, you know, we get we get a reminder that there's things going on here in, in eastern North America that maybe aren't maybe aren't immediately obvious uh, at, at all times. Curious to hear if folks folks felt this or even. Uh, I don't know, even even heard like a rumbling. It was quite deep, so I would doubt that. A lot of times very shallow earthquakes, you can actually like like hear them. This is presumably so far down in the crust. Wouldn't be anything like that going on. But yes, it would have it would have given quite a good uh quite a good shake to a lot of the area actually that you're that you're seeing right now in Google Earth. So uh hope you enjoyed this video. Hope it puts things in a in a little bit of context and hope you check out the next video when it comes along.